Dr. Amy Simon, and I am um, uh, the William and Audrey Farber Family and Holocaust Studies in European Jewish History at MSU. I teach in James Madison Curling Institute for Jewish Studies in Modern Israel, and we are thrilled today to be hosting Professor David Fishman. And we um, just a few words about the institute. Um, we have a lot of upcoming events, um, especially uh, even regarding the Holocaust. We happen to have a lot of events this semester. So next week um, on February 3rd, we have um, also a virtual Zoom event uh, on um, a panel of, there we are, um, uh, reflecting on the Holocaust um, around the, the moment of International Holocaust Remembrance Day, which uh, takes place tomorrow, um, commemorating the liberation of the Auschwitz camp at the end of World War II. And so we have our event today, we have an um, event next week and then throughout the semester. Um, so please, um, you know, always check out our website, get involved in our listserv uh, for all of the exciting speakers that we're bringing in from across the country um, this year and actually across the world. Um, and I am not doing the main introduction. It's my great pleasure to introduce you first to the person who is responsible for this event tonight, um, Sherman Garnett. Um, so Dr. Garnett is um, very, uh, what do I say? It's weird to have to introduce your former dean. Let's put it that way. <laughs> he was the dean of James Madison College for over 20 years. And now we are fortunate enough that he is still on our faculty at JMC. And he is a recent um, member um, of the Serling Institute and an affiliated member of the Institute um, for Jewish Studies. So we're really thrilled to have him there as well. And though he was dean for such a long time, his research is very centered on questions of um, not only Jews, but also the parts of the world where many Jews lived, especially in the first half of the 20th century. So he's teaching a class in James Madison the semester on Vilnius, Vilna, Vilno, which uh, he can express more about that um, if he wants, but um, widely known as the Jerusalem of Lithuania or the Jerusalem of the North with a very large and prominent and an important Jewish community, which of course the book also centers on that we'll be talking about today. And um, finally, he is also in the process of um, writing a book on Czeswo, Czeswo Miłosz, uh, Polish-American poet, Nobel laureate. And um, so his research very much centers um, on this part of the world and the people that we'll be talking about today. So I will turn it over to Dr. Garnett and thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Simon, for the kind introduction. Amy will be returning at the end to moderate the Q&A. Uh, I also wanna thank Professor Arnoff for asking me to be part of this event when I, became Dean at Madison College quite a long time ago. One of the earliest things I did was support a group that was conceiving of and advocating the creation of a permanent Jewish studies program at Michigan State. And in my time as Dean and now as, my, as an affiliated faculty member, it's so satisfying to see that this program not only was established, but it's flourished and is now part of the Serling Institute. And from the first, this program attracted outstanding scholars, teachers, and students. And it's just going to grow. Its future is secure. And one of the highlights of my work in supporting this effort was the role I was able to play in bringing to Michigan State both Yale Aronoff and Amy Simon. And I've been able to watch them excel as teachers and scholars. They both won the Teacher Scholar Awards at Michigan State and both stand as examples of academic excellence and, and impact in the wider world. When you're doing administrative work, you derive, you maybe only derive joy in that field from the successes of your faculty. And both Yale and Amy have given me many occasions for that joy. I'm especially appreciative of Yale's excellence as a leader of the Serling Institute and for her invitation for me to become a faculty member associated with the program. Yeah, I can't help but feel that I'm here, especially in the presence of tonight's speaker, as someone who can claim only a deep and abiding affection for Jewish studies and an outsider's appreciation of the kind of scholarship that uh, David 
Fishman and Amy Simon are doing to bring Vilna um, back before our eyes and to give it the place that it deserves in the human mind. Vilna is a place of Jewish achievement in both traditional and secular realms, even in the most difficult circumstances imaginable as we shall learn tonight. And my route, as Amy suggested, in seeing Vilna's importance began with a study of Czesław Miłosz and the city he calls Vilna. Jewish Vilna and its riches, as Miłosz himself admits, was unknown to him. Jewish and non-Jewish Vilna, he wrote, lived separate lives. He began to acquire a better understanding of Vilna only after he moved to America learning about the religious and secular achievements of its Jewish community. He wrote an appreciative entry in one of his books about Chaim Grave, one that spurred my own reading of this powerful writer. And in fact, Grada is my introduction to Vilna. His My Mother's Sabbath Days led me to tonight's speaker. Almost a decade ago, I was designing a course in which Grada's book would be central. And I needed a historical work that would provide a context for Grada's neighborhood and city, a context that took in the full sweep of Yiddish culture and Jewish life in Vilna. And my search ended when I found Professor Fishman's The Rise of Modern Yiddish Culture, a book that has repaid multiple readings. And at that time, it was nine years ago, I think, Professor Fishman was gracious enough to give a public lecture in that course. He gave another lecture in my freshman writing seminar today where students are looking intensively at interwar Vilna through the eyes of both Grada and Miwash. The students will be reading Professor Fishman's latest book, The Book Smugglers, during this semester. Let me end the introduction by reminding you of just a few of the highlights of Professor Fishman's extensive resume. He is a professor of Jewish history at the Jewish Theological Seminar of America, specializing in the history and culture of East European Jews. His most recent book, which he will address tonight, is, as noted above, The Book Smugglers, Partisan Poets and the Race to Save Jewish Treasures from the Nazis. It has received a National Jewish Book Award and was praised as, quote, the first rate scholarship, one that pulses with the beat of a most human heart. His previous books include Russia's First Modern Jews and The Rise of Modern Yiddish Culture. In addition to these three books, he's published insightful articles and lectured widely through the world. A native New Yorker, Dr. Fishman has also taught at prestigious international institutions such as Brandeis University, bar Ilan University, Russian State University in Moscow, and Vilnius University in Lithuania. He is sought after as a project leader and an advisor on important boards. He serves now, for example, as the director of Project Judaica, which publishes guides to Jewish materials in the archives, libraries, and museums in Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. And he serves as a member of the academic committee of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. We're very fortunate that he is with us tonight. And it's my pleasure to present as our distinguished speaker, Professor David Fishman. Thank you, Professor Garnett. Thank you, Professor Simon. Uh, thank you all of you uh, for coming tonight. Uh, I think this is my maybe my third time talking for MSU. I think I visited twice, or at least I enjoyed it so much that it feels like I visited not once, but, um, but twice. Um, and um, this is a special occasion. Many of you may know that tomorrow is International Holocaust Memorial Day. It's the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. And that international date has taken on more and more authority and uh, become more and more widespread uh, around the world over the last decade or so. So um, it's an appropriate uh, time to spend an evening on the topic of my book, The Book Smugglers. Uh, fundamentally, let me warn you, the story though set in the Holocaust is an uplifting one, an inspiring one. And uh, therefore, it's not a depressing story in its bottom, uh, bottom line. I'm going to share lots of slides, images, and basically tell uh, aspects of my book through the images. Uh, then we'll come back and, um, and, and look forward to the Q&A. 
okay, most important moment has happened. You can see the, um, the PowerPoint. Now, if I can only get it to be, uh, this out of the way, all right. All right, I'll have to do it this way because I cannot um, make it into slideshow format, at least at the moment. So bear with me as I, I go through it. Um, this is the book. Um, and uh, the, the book, I must tell you, uh, let me begin with the personal kind of story. How did I come to write this book? Um, it takes place in Vilna, which before the war, um, as you can see here, was in northeastern Poland. Today, Vilnius is the capital of independent Lithuania. But um, uh, before the war, it was Poland. Before the First World War, it was Russia. This is a part of the world where borders shifted a lot. Um, my personal story is as follows. I could take off the sharing for that. Um, more than 30 years ago, actually, I'm betraying my age, 32 years ago, I got a call from the director of the Evo Institute here in New York. That's an institute that studies Yiddish culture and the Jews of Eastern Europe. I got a call from the director. I'm a young man. I just got my PhD. And he says, we've just found out, 1989, uh, that there are piles of Jewish books and documents in a former church in Vilnius, Lithuania. Will you come with me to Soviet Vilnius to look at the material and evaluate what it is? Of course, I jumped at the opportunity. Uh, I went, it was still the Soviet Union, the waning years of the Soviet Union. We enter the church, what had once been a church. Um, it, uh, it was a book depository under the Soviets. And we see mountains and mountains of Hebrew and Yiddish books, uh, a pile of Torah scrolls, and we're amazed. Both well, we're 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 heartbroken, but we're also amazed is to see uh, so much uh, Jewish cultural treasures in 1989 in Soviet Lithuania, uh, a whole kaleidoscope of a Jewish experience. And um, I, at that moment, I said, I have to figure out how did this stuff survive? Where is it from? <laughs> um, and how did it end up here in this uh, former church in, in the waning years of the Soviet Union? And I researched, I wrote a little paper, a little article, but I eventually decided this is a topic that can and does and should have a book. And I, I, I was working on many other things. So I really returned to the topic, you know, 20 years after that experience uh, in Vilnius in 1989. And now to the story itself. Um, Vilna, although, um, there we are, um, it, it, Jews always called it Lithuania, even if it belonged to Russia, even if it belonged to Poland. Um, Jews called the city the Jerusalem of Lithuania, Yerushalayim de Lita, and that's a very special title, as has been mentioned. There have been a couple of communities in Jewish history that got such a nickname, Jerusalem, uh, Toledo was called the Jerusalem of Spain. Uh, Frankfurt was called the Jerusalem of Germany. <clears throat> Vilna was called the Jerusalem of Lithuania or of the North. And whenever you find that name, it shows a community with a very special heritage or special reputation. Uh, <clears throat> that Vilna tradition begins with Rabbi Elijah, the Gaon of Vilna, great 18th century rabbi who uh, believe that study of Bible, of Talmud, of other religious literature is the most important precept in Judaism, more important even than prayer or ritual, more important than uh, good deeds and acts of kindness. 
And uh, he became this role model of devotion to study, to the intellectual enterprise. And in that sense, he's the founding father of the tradition of book culture that became central to the Jewish community of Vilna. Um, in his aftermath, uh, Vilna becomes um, a preeminent center of Jewish printing, right? If you've got scholars who want to read, scholars who write, you're going to have printing. On the left, you're seeing a volume of the Talmud printed in Vilna. Uh, Vilna was the uh, the most famous edition of the Talmud, um, that is Judaism's second most sacred book after the Bible, uh, the most authoritative edition of the, of the Talmud is the Vilna edition. And in the 20th century, Vilna was a great center of secular Yiddish literature, uh, of newspapers, of magazines. At its peak on the eve of World War II, there were five daily Yiddish newspapers in this city. Um, let me step back for a moment and explain. The city was had, on the eve of the German occupation, 70,000 Jews, um, it, which constituted, on the eve of the German occupation, about a third of the city's population. A third, that's a, quite a high proportion. Uh, but it was not, by any means, the largest Jewish community, or even one of the largest Jewish communities. It was the fourth largest Jewish community in Poland, after Warsaw, Lodz, and Lemberg, Lvov. Uh, there were many more Jews in Odessa than in Vilna. Uh, so it's not so much its num numeric distinctiveness. You know, it's, it's, uh, uh, as I often say to, uh, to students, this is not, this is like the Jewish Oxford, right? It's not London. In the big city. It's Oxford, the center of academic study. Um, this is an image, a drawing of uh, two buildings. In the, in the back is the great synagogue of Vilna, and in the foreground is the Jewish community library, the Strashun Library, um, really a central cultural institution um, of, of the community. It was the greatest library under Jewish auspices in Europe. Um, it had five Jew Hebrew incunabula, that is books printed before 1500, and it had hundreds of rare Hebrew books from the 1500s. It, uh, this community, so this is a, a community of readers. Um, the library was open actually seven days a week, um, even, Saturday, Shabbat, it was open. Um, if you had ordered a book previously, you could come in and read. That was an important symbolic statement that reading and study are integral to life and there's no day off from that. So Vilna had the greatest library under Jewish auspices. It also had a great uh, research institute, YIVO, the same YIVO I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, um, that existed in New York since World War II, was founded in Vilna in 1925. And it had the greatest Jewish archive in Europe. It kept records of organizations, um, collections of manuscripts, um, letters by great writers, um, all kinds of documents uh, were collected here at YIVO, which also had its reading room and its all kinds of um, public activity. Uh, there were many other institutions, um, uh, a museum, Talmudic academies, teacher seminaries. Of course, when you've got a community of scholars and uh, uh, a lot of them have personal libraries that are, have, uh, of, great, that are of great value. Finally, Vilna was a city um, not only of, of readers, but of writers, of modern writers. In the 20th century, most Vilna Jews are no longer pious. They are modern uh, Jews of different stripes. This is the literary group, Jung Vilna. Young Vilna, uh, poets, storytellers, uh, novelists, 
and even one or two plastic artists. The two heroes of my book are these two people. Um, in the middle is Schmerke Kaczerginski. I'm going to call him Schmerke. Um, an orphan. His parents died during World War I. Um, not many. He was raised in an orphanage, but he grew out to become a, a poet, uh, which is unusual. Um, he uh, is a person of the left. He belonged to the Communist Party, the underground Communist Party in Poland. He's a political poet very much. Next to him is good friend of Rom Sutskever. Sutskever, Sutskever um, was the opposite of his friend Schmerke. He's apolitical, um, says I'm not a Zionist, I'm not a socialist. The only ideology I believe in is poetry. Um, he writes a lot of nature poetry about snow, about trees. Um, and uh, he's the grandson of a rabbi, though he's not uh, particularly religious himself. So these two poets um, are at the heart of this group, young Vilna. Now to get to the, 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 the core of the story itself, to the body of the, of the story, which it takes place in the period of the German occupation. The Germans arrived in Vilna in late June, 1941, as part of the war against the Soviet Union. Vilna was far enough east. They didn't arrive there in September 1939. They arrived in June 1941. Um, they came late, you could say, but they worked very fast. In the first six months of the German occupation, from late June till the end of December, 1941, the Jewish population of Vilna decreased from 70,000 to 20,000. That is more than two thirds of the Jews of Vilna were murdered in just six months time. They were not sent to Auschwitz or Treblinka or some other kind of death camp. Those camps had not even been built yet in the second half of 1941. Um, they were simply taken to the outskirts of town where there were pits and they were mowed down by machine gun in a place called Ponar in Yiddish or Ponari in Polish, Panerai in Lithuanian. Um, the, there were originally two Vilna ghettos, but all the inhabitants of the Northern ghetto, ghetto number two were virtually all were murdered. Um, ghetto number one, the main ghetto um, existed for two, years. Um, and mo this is the gate to the Vilna ghetto, the entrance. Um, the 20,000 who um, remained alive as of January 1942, they lead a difficult and rather grim existence. The official food rations are very meager, so food is short in short supply. Uh, and their life, they are, most of them are slave laborers for the Germans. Um, they work in different places, factories, the railway station. And they basically, what that means is they leave every morning through this gate for work and they come back at the end of the day. Uh, uh, tired and emaciated. And if they can during the day, they're trying to find food, maybe exchange barter something with a non-Jewish coworker and smuggle it in uh, to the ghetto for their for family members, for either elderly or children who did not leave the ghetto. Uh, but the, of course, there are guards at the gate. And if they're found smuggling food, they, they can be either beaten very badly or uh, even sent to their death. There was a popular singer in Jewish Vilna and in the Vilna ghetto, Luba Levitskaya. She smuggled in a bag of peas under her, uh, on her neck, under her shirt, but she was found, the bag of peas was, was found and she was sent to her death for that bag of peas. Their only hope for these 20,000 is that maybe 
the Red Army will come in from the East and liberate them from German occupation. Now, I must talk to you about this organization, the Einsatzstab Reichsleiter Rosenberg, the ERR, the special um, brigade, special um, unit of um, the German Reich leader, Alfred Rosenberg. The, this organization is an organization devoted to looting cultural treasures all across, across Europe. Uh, the master race should have all the art in the world, all the rare books in the world, um, and therefore they loot national libraries and museums from Paris and Amsterdam, you know, all the way westward um, to Kiev and uh, Minsk and everywhere in between. Uh, it is a major or organization, and they send this, uh, the, the, the valuable material they send uh, to Germany for German libraries, for, um, for uh, German museums. What isn't as well known is that this organization, the ERR, had a special department for looting Judaica, that is books, manuscripts, documents related to the history and culture of the Jews books in Hebrew and Yiddish. It's very paradoxical. The Germans are murdering Jews and collecting, quote unquote, uh, Jewish books. Why are they collecting Jewish books? The, the, the answer is because the Germans have a special field of scholarship, quote unquote scholarship, which is called Judenforschung, study of the Jews which is anti-Semitic Jewish studies. The Germans want to prove scientifically that the Jews are a peril, that the Jews are degenerate, that, and that the Jews must be uh, persecuted and executed and exterminated. Uh, they want to prove that scientifically. And they have scholars who use different fields of the social sciences and humanities, and including scholars that know Hebrew and Yiddish who can scour through Jewish literature and prove just how debased and harmful the Jews are. That's why they're collecting the material. The head of that department is this man, Dr. Johannes Paul, uh, originally trained to be a Catholic priest um, and got advanced um, studies in Rome at first and then in Jerusalem. He, studied in a pontifical institute in Jerusalem in the 1930s. He's uh, fluent in Hebrew, both biblical Hebrew, modern Hebrew. He's, he knows Yiddish thoroughly, and he is in charge of this operation everywhere in Europe. And the, whatever he finds, he sends to this place, to Frankfurt to this place called the Institute for the Investigation of the Jewish Question. This is a Hebrew book. But if you look on the bottom, you see the stamp of the Institute for the Investigation of the Jewish Question with the uh, swastika on it. Um, Paul knows, as anybody would have known in those days, that Vilna is special, that it's got this great library, it's got this great institute, it's got great collections. And Dr. Paul is in Vilna two weeks after the German army, the Wehrmacht, conquers the city. And he scour, he's going over the territory, the, the library, the YIVO Institute. And even he is stunned and amazed at the amount of material, the amount of riches are there that are there. And he has a problem because he can't send everything to Germany. I mean, it's just too much. And by the way, with so many libraries and so many so much. You don't need to send five copies of the same book to Germany. You need one copy. So he realizes quickly he needs a system to um, select, to sort, to decide what will be sent to Germany for Judenforschung and what will be sent to be destroyed. Who can do that work? There aren't dozens of Johannes Pauls out there in Germany. So he decided, hey, we'll do it all, what, what we're always doing, which is we'll create 
a, a group of Jewish slave laborers, and they will do the sorting for us, what goes to Germany and what is to be destroyed. Um, and he creates that slave labor brigade, which got the nickname, the paper brigade. It was headed by this man, um, Hermann Kruk, uh, a professional librarian from Warsaw originally, he fled Warsaw in 39, but the Germans caught up with him in Vilna in 41. Uh, he actually directed a library inside the Vilna ghetto. Uh, the Germans uh, appoint him as director of this brigade and his deputy, uh, Kruk is a socialist, a Bundist, a member of the Jewish Socialist Party, the Bund. Um, his deputy is a scholar, Zelik Kalmanovich from Yivo, uh, Kalmanovich, this man, the scholar, um, uh, knew, knew actually one person once said about him, when he walks into the room, I don't need an encyclopedia. I, anything I need to know, he can tell. Um, in the late 30s, he becomes both a Zionist and a religious believer. So the, these are two people heading this brigade. Um, one socialist and you know committedly secular, the other a Zionist and, and a believer. They have under them um, 18 uh, intellectuals uh, working for them. There were 20 intellectuals, including the two of them, and 20 technical workers who do various tasks in this brigade. The brigade works in the former building of the Evo Institute. Now, a lot of the books are already there. Let's just set as the Germans grab it and, and convert it into their into the uh, work site. Uh, these 20 intellectuals are a cross section of the surviving Jewish intelligentsia in Vilna. After 50,000 have been killed, the remaining 20,000, it uh, has still surviving intellectuals, um, uh, scholars, educators, uh, writers, um, and even an artist and a musician as well. And our poets, the two poets I talked about earlier, Schmerke and Sutzkever, um, uh, are joined, are employed, are, are selected. Um, Crook did the selecting, the head of the brigade, uh, to work in this um, brigade. And alongside them in this picture is someone with a very special story. This is their friend, uh, Rachel Krinsky, Rachel Pupko Krinsky. She was before the war, a high school teacher of history at Vilna's best Jewish high school. And I had several Jewish high schools. Um, she had a master's degree from Vilna University in history. She knew Latin, she knew old Polish, a very educated woman, um, but her personal story quite tragic. Her husband was killed by the Germans in the very, one of the very first roundups. In July, 1941, he sent to Brunach, she's a widow. When the ghetto is formed, which is a couple months later, September, 1941, she decides she, uh, they had a two year old uh, girl, a toddler. And when the ghetto is formed, she decides she's not taking her toddler into the ghetto. She hands her little child over to her Polish nanny, her Polish babysitter. And the nanny moves with the baby, with the child to another part of town and raises it as if it were her own daughter. Um, the girl, the mother and daughter will not see each other for the full remainder of the war. She goes, uh, Rachel Krinsky goes into the ghetto alone. And actually the only support she has um, is are her friends, like the poets, and, and yes, reading, especially poetry, which she loved, which she says in her memoirs gave her a lot of strength. And the work is, uh, is all day long creating piles, piles of books, what should go to Germany? What 
should go and be destroyed, basically discarded as garbage. The Germans set as a quota, only 30%, no more than 30% can be sent to Germany. They're no fools, they're not gonna let these Jewish laborers send everything to Germany. 70% uh, must be destroyed. For them, for these Jewish intellectuals, this is excruciating work. This is a form of torture. They're all book lovers. They're all readers. They're all people of culture. And they are being forced to participate in the looting and destruction of their own culture. Um, they, they have to stand there as bulldozers literally come by and pick up piles of uh, rare books and documents as if they're trash and discard them. And it's, it, it's, it's morally uh, very difficult for them to do that. Um, perhaps there's only one exception to this general picture I've given to you about the books and papers, something that was not sent to Germany, but not totally destroyed. And that is Torah scrolls. Torah scrolls are the holiest object in the Jewish religion, um, read in the synagogue, especially on the Sabbath. Uh, they're made of parchment, they're scrolls. And the Germans would cut up the scrolls into little pieces to use them to repair Nazi army boots. Uh, and this picture really conveys just the sense of, um, first of all, the of desecration of what it meant to destroy Jewish culture. And also, I think for any Jew looking at this picture, it can, you can sense the uh, feeling of burning anger that these members of this brigade had, um, that they can't allow this. this is, they, they can't, they have, there has to be another way. There has to be an, something that can be done so that all of these cultural treasures, these rare books, these historical documents, that they not all be sent to Germany or sent away as garbage. And the way they come up with, the main way, there were many, many ways, I'm not gonna mention all of them even, was to hide material under their clothing. Others were smuggling clothes, uh, food, they're smuggling books under their clothing, documents and papers, um, especially in winter, that's easier to do, but even in regular weather, they even made diapers underneath their pants. Right, so uh, and garters and things like that to to bring papers in. They want to smuggle it back into the ghetto because that the ghetto is nonetheless Jewish territory. It's familiar territory, um, and they want to know where it is and that it's safe. So they want to smuggle it from the work site, which is outside the ghetto, back in, uh, which means they have to pass by guards and. Um, truth is, if the guards are Lithuanian guards, that's not very serious. Uh, there was also Jewish ghetto police, but that's not very serious. What's very serious is if there are Germans at the gate. From time to time, um, Germans um, man the gate. Uh, and then all bets are off. Then, yes, you, it could have happened that for smuggling in papers or, or books, um, they be sent to their deaths. Smuggling books were just as serious as smuggling food. In that sense, they were lucky. Um, a couple of them were beaten badly at the gate, but none of them uh, were sent to their deaths at the gates. And many times they got, um, they got by, many, many times, uh, most times. Uh, and my book does describes many dramatic moments at the gate I'll only mention one briefly. Rachel Akrinsky, the high school teacher, tried to smuggle in a goblet, a, a silver cup used for Kiddush, for the blessing over wine on the Sabbath, um, you know, an artistic uh, ritual object. Uh, she was, it was discovered by a German, and everyone around her was sure she'd be she's dead, she's gonna be killed. She didn't lose her cool. And she turned around and said to the German, oh, I brought this for you, it's a present, take it. And by the way, I happen to have a very nice pair of um, gloves 
for your wife, take them too. Basically, she was hoping to bribe the German. And the German was in a good mood that day and uh, took the stuff, took the bribe basically, and let her through. She was just very, very, very lucky that day. Uh, last thing I'll say about this is uh, this, this paper brigade worked for a year and a half. And there are 20 intellectuals involved in smuggling material. I'm simply doing math with you. Let's say that two pe uh, 20 people take in two items, each of them, uh, for 500 days, right? Well, that means, if I'm not mistaken, 20,000 items can be taken in that way. So the enormous, uh, you know, drip by drip, day by day, um, uh, you, you can bring in a lot of uh, material into the ghetto this way. And once in the ghetto, they're hidden in bunkers, mainly. This is a, the, the top bunker in the Vilna ghetto. It was constructed by a Jewish engineer. You enter through the sewage system um, and you take a ladder down. Um, and this bunker was constructed for two for many purposes, but I'll mention only two, um, deep under the ground of the Vilna ghetto. Um, it was used by the armed resistance in the Vilna ghetto. Um, there was an organization in the Vilna ghetto, the FPO, the United Partisan Organization. And they were planning a great Vilna ghetto uprising. So they <clears throat> kept arms, guns of different kinds, munitions, in this bunker. But right next to them, this bunker also hid rare books, manuscripts, documents, and really symbolizes the two forms, these two different forms of resistance. Because what this smuggling operation was a form of resistance to the Germans. We will not let them destroy our culture. Uh, so there was the armed resistance and the moral resistance, uh, literally. Uh, rubbing shoulders in this bunker. I do want to mention only one other way um, materials were rescued, and that is with non-Jewish friends. Uh, this is Ona Shemaita. She's an ethnic Lithuanian, a professional librarian, actually at the Vilna University Library, um, a socialist, and also a friend of Jews. Um, she rescued a lot of material. How? Rather strange and funny story, which is the Germans, the German supervisors, the German masters, Dr. Paul and the others from the ERR, they left the work site for lunch every day for an hour, an hour and a half. And they left the work site unsupervised during that hour, hour and a half. Nobody's going to escape. First of all, if anybody escapes, any of the slave laborers, um, there'll be there's always collective punishment and reprisal. Reprisal, meaning their family, their friends, their maybe their whole apartment, their whole block, hundreds will be killed if anybody escapes. So they don't escape. And by the way, in Nazi-occupied Poland, it's not exactly clear where you'll escape and who will help you if you do escape. So the workers stay there. But during that long lunch break, non-Jewish friends can come to the work site and they can give a little food to the, uh, to the laborers, to the slave laborers, and they can take out papers and books and larger items, even uh, artwork, as long as they leave before, um, before the Germans come back. So Anna Shemaitya was really the most active person in terms of visiting and as far and, and in terms of hiding a material. Um, she even did more amazing things. She entered on a couple of occasions the Vilna ghetto. That was very rare because non-Jews could not enter the ghetto, I mean, regular inhabitants of the city. But she went over to the and she says, I'm a librarian at the university library. 
And, you know, ghetto inmates entered the ghetto and they took with them our library books. Their overdue library books have got to go into the ghetto to collect our library books. And uh, the Germans believed her and let her enter the ghetto where she met with people and uh, tried to console them, to strengthen them. And sometimes she would take books and papers out of the ghetto. In other words, the very stuff that had been smuggled into the ghetto, she then took out of the ghetto and hid in her apartment or at the university. And again, she said to the guards, look, these are the overdue library books I told you about. Uh, one time on a Shemaitya uh, did something even more than that. When she left the ghetto, uh, it was a rainy day, she hid a little Jewish girl under her coat and she smuggled that girl out of the ghetto, hit her in her home, and that girl survived and settled eventually after the war in Israel. Ona Shemaitya is one of the very first people that Yad Vashem recognized as a righteous among the nations, a righteous Gentile for saving that girl and for saving cultural treasure. She was recognized as a righteous uh, Gentile in 1966. Okay, I'm gonna move on. Our poets survive. They actually left the ghetto a week before the Germans dissolved it. They were able to smuggle themselves through the sewage system. You know, you crawl under sewers, it's filthy, but you get out. And then from there, they left to the forests and they'll be partisan fighters uh, in the forests against the Germans. Um, during the war, both, both the poets. The heads of this brigade, if you remember the librarian, the, scholar, the socialist librarian and the religious Zionist scholar, they both perished. Most of the members of this work, they were a brigade perished. Uh, the heads and most of them were, when the ghetto was dissolved, liquidated, they were deported to different either extermination camps or labor camps, uh, which uh, at this stage in 43, 44, very little difference between a labor camp and an extermination camp. In other words, people work until they die. Uh, they were sent to camps in Estonia. Our fifth hero, Rachel Krinsky, the high school teacher of history with the daughter, she went to a camp called Stutthof near Danzig, which was a, a labor camp that became also a death camp. It had a crematorium for bodies. She sur miraculously survived. She really didn't think she kept on seeing smoke coming up from the crematorium, thought she'd be next, but she did survive. She survives a, a very broken woman. We uh, Her letters, we have letters of hers right after the liberation when she's liberated. And they're very uh, heartbreaking letters. She says, I really don't know what to do with this life that I now have. I see other people are um, falling in love. I can't imagine getting love. There is no meaning to this life. Um, she writes in her letters to friends from the camp. She has only one healthy instinct. She wants to reunite with her daughter. Uh, she writes in the letters, it's not that I can do anything for my daughter. In my current state, I can't help my daughter. I hear or I saw and I heard when I was in the ghetto that my nanny was doing very nicely taking care of my daughter. So it's not that I can help my daughter, but maybe my daughter can help me. Maybe I will find some kind of value and meaning in this life by being together with her. And that will happen. I'll explain briefly a little later, but that does happen. The poets come back to Vilna. Once the Red Army liberates Vilna, which is in July 1944, the Red Army pushes the Germans back, July 1944, the poets come back to Vilna. What they find is a city in ruins, especially the old Jewish quarter is in, is, uh, in physical ruins. This is the synagogue of the Vilna Gaon in, in ruins. This is the Yivo building that Yiddish Institute, which was hit directly by a bomb in the Battle of Vilna. They come back, 
not mainly to find friends or family. They know virtually no one is alive. And they're not coming back to claim personal property like an apartment. They come back because they have to finish the job. You know, they have buried this material under the ground and they now have to find it and dig it up. They owe it to their murdered colleagues. And they owe it to the Jewish people. And they begin a retrieval operation, um, which is, as you can see, this is Sutzkever on the left, hand wagons, and all the survivors that come to Vilna, mainly on a volunteer basis, are working because it's a lot of work to dig up these bunkers. Um, they don't really have any kind of machines. So it's really about very primitive shovels and, uh, you know, or your bare hands. But they retrieve a lot, including even fragments of Torah scrolls, no full Torah scrolls, but fragments of Torah scrolls. Again, this is the poet Sutzkever in the middle and another famous figure from the Vilna ghetto, the leader of the partisans of the ghetto, the fighters of the ghetto, Habakovner, who was involved in the retrieval operation. And they find art, they find mountains of newspapers, and they create a Jewish museum in Vilna. In July 1944, late July 1944. And that museum has a building in the territory of the former ghetto. It's a ruined building, bad shape, but still it's a building. They got a building. And if you're, it had a big courtyard. If you're looking and you're curious, this courtyard under the ghetto was used as a sports field, the ghetto sports field. Um, and this courtyard's important because the building was in such bad shape that a lot of the papers and books that they collected, that they dug up, that they found, were put in the courtyard, were kept outdoors until they could repair the building. <clears throat> One thing they hadn't thought about, the poets and the others, Vilna is liberated, the Germans are gone, but the city is now part of the Soviet Union. And the head of the Lithuanian Bureau of the Communist Party is Mikhail Suslov, who was a close lieutenant of Joseph Stalin's. Suslov sent from Moscow to make order in Lithuania. And he is a strong opponent of having any Jewish cultural life in Vilna, uh, and he is dead set about obstructing the activity of this museum. Uh, this comes to a head one night when the um, sanitation department, the trash department, uh, comes in the middle of the night and takes away everything that was in the courtyard and it's sent away as trash. In other words, the Germans had sent 70% away as trash. And now the Soviets sent some of the material away as trash. And that's when the poets realize the material is in danger again. It's, no, it's not safer under the Soviets compared to uh, <clears throat> under the, the Nazis. And they decide they're going to leave Vilna. They're going to leave Soviet Lithuania for Poland, a neighboring state, because they were Polish citizens before the war and Polish citizens were allowed to leave the Soviet Union for Poland. So they decide they're leaving and they're gonna smuggle whatever they can out uh, of the Soviet Union in suitcases, some of them suitcases with false bottoms, various means, devices, many people. Uh, whatever they could. They couldn't take everything out, but they actually took a lot out. They got a lot of other survivors like them leaving for Poland and every one of them took something. And that material uh, ended up going first to Poland, where you can see our two poets again here in Poland. Poland uh, wasn't very auspicious because there were pogroms, there were anti-Jewish riots after the war in Poland. Uh, they won't stay there long. But that same journey also happened with Rachel Krinsky. She left for her, from her camp in Stutthof for Poland, and she wrote to the nanny and said, you're a Polish nanny. You're a former Polish citizen. Please 
take my daughter and migrate with her to Poland and I'll meet you in Lodz. I'll meet you in, in the Polish city of Lodz. And she met her daughter and the three of them lived together after the war. It's a very difficult tri a triangle because this girl, now a six-year-old, doesn't even remember who this woman is. From her perspective, Benani is her mother. Um, and it takes a lot of uh, pain, but a lot of effort until they bond. And in one of her later letters, Rachava can write, you know, I'm her mother again. Uh, and she too will not stay in Poland. Okay, to finish uh, the narrative part of the story, the Jewish museum is closed. Mikhail Suslov had his way and um, he closes it down. All the material is sent, whatever was left, to different Lithuanian repositories, including this book depository, a former church where they lay, the materials lay there in this former church for more than 40 years, right? In the, uh, the Jewish Museum was closed in 49. And I saw that material in that very church in 89. Uh, for 40 years without anyone knowing it was there, uh, only with the collapse of the Soviet Union did the material become known to people. Uh, I have two things to wrap up. First, uh, some examples, what did they rescue? I'm just going to literally rattle off a few items so you've got a sense, what are we talking about when we say books and papers? Uh, a diary by Theodore Herzl, the father of uh, modern Zionism. The record book of the synagogue of the Vilna Gaon. The synagogue itself was destroyed, showed you a picture of the ruins, but it has a minute book that spans 150 years from the 1760s to the 1910s. It survived. All kinds of synagogue art and ornaments. Uh, letters by the um, great Yiddish writer, Sholem Aleichem, uh, who was the author of Tevye the Dairyman. Tevye, which became the basis for Fiddler on the Roof. A bust of Leon Tolstoy uh, done live. In other words, Tolstoy posed for a Jewish sculptor named Ilya Ginsburg. And finally, some material from the Holocaust period itself. This is a call to arms for to fight by the FPO, the fighters of the Vilna Ghetto to the inhabitants, do not go like sheep to the slaughter, is the title of this call to arms. Uh, what happened to our heroes, to wrap it up? Sutskewe, uh, they left from uh, Poland to Paris, both of them. Um, they sent much of the material in their possession to New York, to the Yivo in New York. Uh, though not all, so it's held on to some of it, uh, but most of it went to the Evo in New York. Uh, Sutzker settled in Israel, continued to be a Yiddish poet for uh, a very long time, very very successful poetic career. Shmerka Kaczaginski was no longer a communist. He'd seen what communism does. Uh, he ended up settling in Buenos Aires in Argentina and headed a Jewish cultural organization uh, there. And actually when he took that job said, I know what devotion to Jewish culture is. Me and my colleagues in the paper brigade showed what it means to be uh, uh, devoted to culture. And uh, Rachel Krinsky came to New York. She had relatives, she had a brother here in New York and uh, she, lo and behold, she remarried. She remarried a fellow survivor of the Vilna Ghetto, something she could never have imagined in, when she was liberated from the camp, but she would even do. She raised her daughter to adulthood and also had a granddaughter. Uh, that granddaughter lives in the Bay Area uh, near Berkeley in California today. So these are people who are uh, heroes of a different kind, uh, not armed heroes, but I think anybody that is willing to risk their life for a noble cause bigger than themselves. They weren't thinking about rescuing themselves. In fact, they all assumed they're going to be killed, but they were uh, willing to risk their life and even to die um, for something that mattered to them. 
And that something was uh, Jewish cultural heritage. They did it, uh, many reasons why they did it. They did it for the future. They thought that uh, the Jew there will be a Jewish people, it will need its cultural treasures. Uh, um, and they did it as a kind of existential statement. If I, I, I have limited time left on this planet, I'll probably be killed any day now. I'd, the remainder of my life and probably my death, I'd like to connect to something valuable. Um, I, I, I don't want to be murdered because I smuggled a potato. I want to be murdered be, at least because I tried to rescue something important like a rare book or a manuscript. So um, when we think of heroism during the Holocaust, of course we think of uprisings and things like that, but there are many, many ways that people were heroes. And um, this is a story of, of true moral fortitude and heroism for culture. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fishman. That was amazing. Um, not nearly as amazing as your book, though. So I certainly <laughs> recommend it to everybody. Um, for those of you who don't know about my work, I look at um, Yiddish diaries written in Warsaw Woods, Vilma Ghettos, and um, Herman Cook is one of the major diarists that I have worked with. Um, and you know, I'm very familiar with all of these people and had known about the Paper Brigade for a long time. And yet when this book came out, um, I can't overstate its thoroughness and it's, you know, just the amazing story that it tells of something we kind of knew, but the pulling together of all of the sources to, you know, get at the details of how this looked on a day-to-day -day basis as they actually carried out this, you know, rescue mission, um, uh, is just phenomenal. So thank you for both your presentation and for your research in this book. Um, so I'm going to moderate the, um, the Q&A and I will start. Also, let me just say personally, I have a lot of students here. So thank you so much for all my students for, uh, for uh, being here tonight. Um, so the first question I have is from one of my students who asks um, what happened to the artifacts that were sent back right to Germany, the ERR and um, and uh, part of that is how much of the archive in whole was preserved through the Nazi and Soviet occupations, you know, all together. Okay. Well, first of all, I congratulate your student. <laughs> Be no, re the reason is because I intentionally leave that out in the, when I give this kind of talk and I always wait to see, well, anybody, he asked me what happened with the material sent to Germany. And then I know if they, if they asked that, that it was a good audience. So A plus. Um, the answer is the material sent to Germany ended up in Frankfurt, where this Institute for the Study of the Jewish Question uh, was based. Uh, after the war, Frankfurt was in the American zone of occupied Germany. The American military discovered this material and after a lot of deliberation, decided to send it to the Evo in New York. The Evo had been reconstituted during the war, no longer in Vilna, but in New York. And so the American military uh, sent that material. So it's very ironic that the material looted and sent to Germany actually was returned to Jewish hands and to public use. Um, actually had a much happier uh, fate than, let's say, the material that remained in Vilnius, Soviet Vilnius, and was languishing there in a, uh, in a former church for 40 years. So uh, that's the answer to the first part. Second part's much harder to answer. <clears throat> what, uh, at least Crook in his diary uh, and others I'm trying to, uh, say, that the vast majority of material was destroyed. Um, and the, uh, they, they were not satisfied. They thought that they had rescued only a small, small part. Um, I will say, I think you, here one has to make a distinction between books and papers. 
Um, in other words, books are published in hundreds or thousands of copies. So I don't think there were, uh, but, 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 but documents are unique. They're often in one copy. So I think a lot of effort went, I think a large proportion of the documents um, was saved, but that's just a hunch. Uh, we have, I've tried very hard, it's very hard to quantify what percentage uh, survived. Thank you. Um, the next question we have is from a professor in our history department, um, Dr. Matt Pauley, who, um, who works on Ukraine. And he says, how did the Soviet persecution of the Jewish anti-fascist committee impact the efforts of the book smugglers? And did analogous rescue operations occur elsewhere in Poland and the USSR? Okay, I just want to make sure I got the first part. Uh, it was about the Jewish anti-fascist committee. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat the first part so I make sure? How I did the Soviet persecution uh, of the Jewish anti-fascist uh, committee impact the efforts of the book smugglers? Okay. Well, that's a simple. All right, just for everybody to understand, the Jewish anti-fascist committee was a kind of Jewish organization founded during World War II to bring to the world public attention um, both the crimes of the Nazis and the heroism of, of Jewish fighters in the Red Army. And it, it served many purposes. It had published books and a newspaper. And uh, it is extraordinary to have a kind of that kind of Jewish organization in the Soviet Union. It continued to exist for a number of years after the war. Um, okay, and activists were Yiddish, Soviet Yiddish writers. Um, it was closed down in at the end of 1948, and its most prominent members, well, were arrested, and and many of them were eventually executed by the Soviets. Um, so the closure of the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee, which was based in Moscow, is a landmark event in Soviet Jewish history. It represents the liquidation of Soviet Yiddish culture, right? It's at the same time, it's not just the anti-fascist committee. The Moscow Yiddish theater was closed. The Moscow Yiddish newspaper was closed. The Moscow Yiddish publishing house was closed. Um, hundreds of Yiddish writers were arrested and there will be virtually no Yiddish culture in the Soviet Union for a decade afterwards. So it, it's a major, major, Event the the closure and uh, of the of the Jewish anti-fascist committee. Um, I'm sorry for that detour, but just to explain the the closure of this Jewish museum in Vilna and the closure of the Jewish anti-fascist committee happened in the same campaign. Uh, yes, it happened a couple months later. The museum in Vilna was liquidated in June of 1949, but it's it's part of the same thing: Yiddish culture, Jewish culture was liquidated everywhere in the Soviet Union. Um, Moscow, Vilnius, whatever there was in Kiev um, as well. Um, so it's directly related. Um, the second part was, were there similar rescue operations? I've, I've looked to see it. Well, first of all, there was never as large an operation as the Vilna operation. The ERR stole Jewish books from Kaunas, Kovna, from Minsk, from Kiev. They did similar things, but, um, but not as systematically. And they never had a large Jewish slave labor brigade. Whatever I check these other places, it's small, two, three people. Um, Vilna was their biggest Jewish project uh, for the Nazis. This is, you know, if they got Vilna, they got everything that matters. Um, and I don't know of a similar rescue effort uh, in any other city. And I, I've checked with the best I can. There's no traces of it. Of course, not, not impossible because you can understand that a small group, two, three people, they could all have been murdered. We just may not know of other cases. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there are a few questions here about kind of your research um, in terms of, you know, what was your reaction 
to the artifacts that you found in the church when you got there? You know, did you already know how they had ended up there or was, you know, the story, you know, what you researched and found out after kind of what was surprising, most shocking to you um, about this story? Um, and I'll add my own to that, which is, um, you know, I'm kind of curious about the post 89 uh, process, right? I'm assuming most of this went back to Yivo in New York, but it sounds like there was an enormous amount. So I'm also curious kind of what happened um, to what the things that you did find after you found them. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> let me start. Everybody who was there in 89 had a hunch of sort of the bare bones of the story. After all, we knew that Sutzkever, the poet, had rescued material in the ghetto and had smuggled it out of the Soviet Union, sent to Yivo. That was known. So, you know, the hunch immediately was, right, this is the other stuff, the stuff that Sutzkever didn't smuggle out of the um, Soviet Union. I mean, that made sense. And as soon as we looked at what the material was, um, so in a, in a very bare bones way, we had an idea. Uh, we had no idea what had happened after the war. Uh, knew very little about Jewish Museum. I say myself and also the other people from Evo or about how it ended up in that building. We had no idea until people started telling us. Um, so um, it, yeah, it was very emotional experience and probably one of the biggest professional personal experiences in my whole life. You know, it was the moment where I thought, now I know why I'm a Jewish historian. I was put on this earth to come here to Vilnius and to see this and to, um, uh, all right, so, so it meant a lot uh, to all of us in that group back then. Um, all right, I'll leave that aside. I don't want to get um, sort of detoured. Uh, well, maybe I will mention one thing. The Lithuanians then in 1989 hired a group of elderly Jews to start cataloging the books. Elderly Jews, because the only people that knew Yiddish and Hebrew in 1989 in Soviet Vilnius were old people. They had still gotten a Jewish education before the war. Anybody raised after the war, there were no Jewish schools in the Soviet Union. So these elderly people, and the head of that group hired in 1989 was a woman from Kovna, Kaunas. And we talked started talking and immediately ended up she and I had had the same Yiddish teacher. She had studied with that man, Yudelmar, in the 1930s in Kovna. And I had studied with him 40 years later in the 1970s. Um, so that, again, this is all like a time machine, right? In other words, everything comes together. Yivo in America, Yivo in Vilna, uh, the teacher, who was in Kovna, but also in New York. Okay, that's my personal experience from then with things I did not include in the book. Um, oh, as far as the later history, post 89. No, the book, uh, it's complicated, but I will simply say the vast majority of the material is still in Lithuania today. It's in much better shape. It's um, in the Lithuanian National Library where there is a Judaica department. And by now there are younger people who know Hebrew and Yiddish who are caring for the material. And the American YIVO with the Lithuanian National Library have engaged in an enormous digitization project when they've digitized everything and it will all be available online. Much of it is already available online. In other words, the material was not, um, there was in the 90s, some material was sent to New York, copied and then sent back to Lithuania. Uh, but basically, the basic story is the, uh, the material is uh, that stayed in Lithuania is still in Lithuania, but it will now be accessible worldwide uh, online. 
Thank you. That is amazing. Um, even since I did my dissertation research, so much more is available online. Um, and, and, and yeah, it just makes all of this so much more accessible. So thank you. Um, there are a bunch of questions here about kind of other places. Um, and so somebody mentioned Odessa in particular, which you hadn't mentioned yet, whether there was a paper brigade at the time. And somebody else asked whether you're familiar with um, other such events in other kind of, you know, oppressions or genocides, such as Cambodia or Rwanda, these like cultural um, rescue yeah. missions. That's a great question. <laughs> um, right. In other words, the destruction of cultural treasures is a feature in all genocides, right? And we've seen it, you know, <laughs> um, in many places as part of the extermination of the people there's a destruction of their cultural treasures. This story is a little bit different because of the, Ger first of all, from the German side, because the Germans in their commitment to science didn't want to destroy everything. They wanted to destroy a lot and then use the rest for their sort of diabolical science. So they actually preserved, quote unquote, some cultural treasures for their own purposes. That's unusual. Most genocides, you don't see that, you know, um, this kind of the study of the people that you're um, exterminating. Um, I haven't done a comparative study, so I don't know. I would love to know. And I and thank you for asking that. I now have to think about it. You know, efforts there. I'm sure there have been heroic efforts, you know, by different groups, whether in Africa or in Yugoslavia or um, uh, Cambodia. Um, I just don't know about them. But thank you for, for alerting me that I, I should. Thank you. Um, and I'll ask a, a similar question just about comparison within the war or during the war. Um, how does the Vilna operation compare with Ringelblum? And a few years ago we had as an event, you know, we had Sam Casau talking about we will, uh, who will write our history and we have the film uh, a few years later. So uh, some of our audience members are very familiar with the Ringelblum case, but not so much the Vilna case. Okay, I'll answer that in a minute, but I did wanna say something else, which is sort of hovering around many of these questions. And if I don't say it, it would be a, a remiss. Um, because I think that this story happened in Vilna, that's what I was sort of implying, but now I'm gonna say it explicitly. The fact that this story happened, this amazing rescue story happened in Vilna is not coincidental. It is the culmination of the local tradition of love of books, devotion to, to books. You know? In other words, these people were acting the way they acted in part because they were raised in Vilna. And because they were raised in a community that puts such value on the written word and on culture. So for me, this story is the, the culminating event in the history of Vilna Jewry. Um, it, 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 it wouldn't surprise me that we don't have similar stories in other cities because other cities didn't quite have this very particular local um, tradition of uh, book culture. Okay, but now to get back uh, to Ringelblum. Well, I'm mainly, there obviously are features that are similar, um, but let me stress what the Ringelblum group was doing was mainly documenting the present. What is going on in the ghetto? You know, and they're chronicling it and collecting. It's, it's mainly an effort to record the terrible events of the Warsaw Ghetto itself. And of course, then to bury them uh, for posterity. The Vilna group does some of that as well, but its primary focus is on rescuing pre-war Jewish cultural heritage. Um, the hundreds of years of history that, that also could have been erased, right? In other words, had the Germans been fully successful, there would be virtually no document as you would destroy the people and you would destroy the record of their history, not only the record of their extermination in the war, but the record of their four or 500 years before their extermination. So um, the focus of what was being collected 
and rescued was somewhat different. Nonetheless, this, this same aya, this basic feature of rescuing material and burying it for the sake of posterity, that, that's quite similar to the groups in Warsaw and in, in Vilna. They had very little contact with each other. Ringelblum had some contact with Vilna, but uh, you know, now and then a letter with a secret courier, but but there weren't close, you know, these ghettos were, were sealed. So there's not a lot of contact between the groups. Thank you. Um, I have a question about Vilna today, which is um, what is the state of what was formerly the Vilna ghetto like today? Um, the ghetto, meaning the ghetto from the war period. Uh, I imagine that's what's being, uh, uh, well, first, let me say there are Jews in Vilna and Lithuania today. I've been, of course, many, many times. Um, uh, now they say there are 2,000 Jews in, in Vilna and maybe 2,500 in all of Lithuania. Um, so it's really a, a shadow of its former self, um, mainly an elderly community, though there is a Jewish school. Uh, there are actually two Jewish schools, uh, a Chabad and a more open Jewish school, which uh, where about half the students are not Jewish. Ha um, you know, they study Jewish studies, but half the kids are not Jewish, but it's a good school because Jews value education. So there are Jewish institutions uh, in Vilna today. Uh, and a lot, now, if you walk down those streets, there are plaques on the walls where the gate to the ghetto was couple of them, where the uh, where major roundups took place. Uh, so the ghetto is commemorated, maybe a little bit more discreetly than I'd like it. I mean, there's no large monument. The, the large monuments are at Honar, at the mass murder site on the outskirts of town. But still, um, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, there are many Jewish historical plaques on the, on the streets of Vilna um, and of different institutions and individuals. The place where Max Weinrach, the director of YIVO, or the place where YIVO stood now has a, a memorial plaque. So um, the, there is um, memorialization. Um, uh, the Holocaust, well, Lithuania is a young country I, um, and a small country. And uh, I wish Jewish matters were of more interest to the Lithuanian population. Um, but um, they're not. And it's of course very fraught topic because of Lithuanian collaboration uh, during the war. Um, so uh, I will, I guess the bottom line is there is commemoration of the ghetto. I just wish it were on a higher public level. Thank you. I was going to ask about that as well when I did the Vilna Summer Institute, Yiddish Summer Institute in 2005, I think. Uh, Dovid Katz was still the director. And, um, you know, so I'm kind of curious. Maybe it's a, a conversation for another time what your uh, kind of thoughts are on that in terms of, yeah, the, the continuing politics and, and issues around. Um, uh, Jewish, you know, history, memory, and whatnot in, in Vilna. But I will um, actually instead <laughs> give you a question from the audience, uh, which I think is a good one to kind of uh, round out this, this whole talk, which was, you know, could you speak on the continuity of literary tradition throughout Jewish history? It's fascinating how poetry could be such a uniting force. Let me hear that one again. Can could I you speak? Just comment on the continuity of Jewish. Yeah, the continuity. And it just says it's fascinating how poetry could be such a uniting force that there are poets at the center of this instead mm -hmm. of historians, right? Ringelblum is a historian. Ah, I see. Um, I, I got it. Um, well, when I think of the Vilna Jewish community and these people, what I'm thinking of is mainly if this is a story of both continuity and transformation. In other words, 
And that's what makes Vilna so fascinating as a community. In other words, this is a community that started out with rabbis and printing Talmuds and a very religious culture um, in the 18th and first half of the 19th century. Um, but it transforms itself into a great center of modern Jewish culture, which is not about studying the Talmud, but which is about, you know, uh, becomes more and more about, yes, about poetry and about novels and about fiction and literature. Um, and if, in some ways, yes, for the Jews of Vilna, their poets are the modern heirs to their rabbis. You know, these kind of prophetic and moral and intellectual leaders of the community. Um, so I, I think writers had a prominence in the community, poets had a prominence in this community, which, you know, we would only envy in America today, where people don't know much about any poets. Um, so I, I So I think that's my response. That there, there, the, the commitment to reading and writing and to the written word, that's the continuity. But the shift from religious literature to modern literature, that's a real transformation in, in the Jews of Vilna. Thank you very much. Um, we have two minutes left. I will squeeze in another question just because a whole bunch just came in. Um, and it's a really important question, which is um, a question about gender. And do you think that gender played a role in terms of who was able to smuggle material both in and out um, and in terms of punishing those who attempted? And I'm gonna add my question too, which is in terms of uh, what was preserved, um, the things I have found are primarily uh, male authored works. And so I'm kind of, you know, the, the yeah. you know, in terms of what was, preserved from the wartime period? That's my question. And the other question is, you know, gender in terms of smuggling and who could get in and out and, and if there was, uh, you know, something to be said about that gender question. Um, historically, pre-war, um, smuggling was a gendered activity. Hey, Jews have a long history and experience with smuggling, including smuggling literature. The Bund, the Jewish Socialist Party, always had to smuggle its literature um, that it printed abroad, outside of Russia, into Russia. Uh, it printed a lot of its material in Switzerland. And, and the primary smugglers of the Bund were women on the assumption that um, the Russian, czarist Russian uh, police would not, do as thorough a body search on women as they did on men. So I, I'm very mindful that smuggling um, historically had been gendered, uh, that is women played a much bigger role than men in smuggling literature. But in this story, I haven't seen, uh, first of all, women were a minority in the group, a small or proportion of the group. Maybe that says something about the role of women in intellectual life, uh, but there just were less of them in the group. Um, so I haven't seen references that, you know, and I don't think, and I don't, th I think the Nazis are not the same as uh, the Tsarist Russian police. I don't think that the, the niceties of um, <clears throat> giving women an easier time were observed by the Nazis. So I don't think um, uh, the, the smuggling activity per se was in this case um, gendered. Now, uh, Professor Simon, what was your other question? What was related to? My question is about the documents uh, from the wartime that have survived. And my observation has been that the majority of documents um, that I've seen in the archives, in my case, diaries, um, are primarily authored by men. Um, and so I'm wondering if you can comment on, you know, if that's true of the documents. I mean, I, I know you're looking at the, the rescued documents, but kind of any thoughts you might have on that? Um, uh, uh, that's a good question. And I must tell you, you know, yeah, most of the material we think about, the diaries and so forth are by men, or even the poetry written in the ghetto is by men. Um, I, I, I will say 
something related, which is Sutzker, these poets in the Jewish Museum, one of the remarkable things they did is collect testimony. We have survivor testimony from 1944, 1945, um, uh, collected by Sutzker and Schmerke. And And uh, those things are very precious because uh, they're very fresh right off the heels of the events. And a lot of the survivor testimony um, taken in those very early years after the war are by women. In other words, the, so there's a lot of material that could be used to enrich our understanding of gender in the ghetto um, that's awaiting use. In other words, that maybe is an important way to end this is to say, this is such a large, volume of material and such precious material, it will take a long time for our scholars and historians to process it and to use it. And there are many avenues uh, that need to be explored. And again, you know, scholarships are slow. So both pre-war and ghetto, um, th this material will be examined, but it will take decades to uh, really use it and, ex and examine it properly. Thank you very much. I do think that's a great way to end it. And you've given us the starting point by making this story so much more well known um, through this book and through these lectures. And so hopefully, you know, we will continue the, the process of research. So thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you, Dr. Fishman, most of all, Dr. Garnett, Dr. Aronoff for organizing. And in the chat, there's all kinds of information about Jewish studies, you know, the Serling Institute and how you can find out about other events we have going on in the next few weeks.